is that we do have um, the ability to answer some of your questions, hopefully in real time. Um, my, my biggest hope is that the actual prepared presentation that we have and in the discussion that we have, we're gonna address a lot of the questions that you may have now, but um, we do wanna give you a chance to have that interaction and get some feedback on your questions. So do use the chat box. Um, all of our panelists will be helping out to monitor that and make sure that we are um, responding to whatever questions that you may have at that time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And the first thing we wanted to do is actually I'm going to hand it uh, back over to Wendy because I know that she had actually um, taken the initiative to ask you all um, you know, what your experience has been, what your plans are uh, through a survey. And I think it was a great idea that she had, that she wanted to share that, take this opportunity to share some of that data and information with you. So I'll hand it over to Wendy and share the first slide. Thank you so much, Sandra, Roshana, and everybody. It's so good to see my former students. I miss you guys. And um, even though I can't see your faces, we really miss all of you. There are almost 300 people on this call. Um, I believe that many people registered. And um, no surprise, College Park people out, you know, ready to learn and find out what's going on in this crazy time. Um, I wanted to just, if you don't mind, Sandra, just like say a couple things to my sure. students if I have them. So um, one thing is that, you know, we're, we're getting to the end of the semester. So there's always a crunch at the end of the semester where it's hard to get appointments with us. But I did want to let everybody know that we're going to be holding virtual drop-ins. We've, um, Annie on our team figured out a way to, to, to make that really work really well. So we're going to do virtual drop-ins from the 7th all the way through to right before Memorial Day weekend. And we'll be posting information um, to help you um, walk through how to talk with us um, as you're making decisions about grading. And I know we're gonna talk about all of that today. So um, then we'll be available to help you know if you have individual questions afterwards. Um, the, the reason that I did these surveys is because uh, Sandra and I and a lot of our colleagues locally had a meeting last Friday. Um, we call it the local area network meeting. We meet once a year, every year actually. And uh, this year it was supposed to be in person at the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland. And Maryland was gonna be hosting it. And then that didn't happen. And we had to, and also when we started planning it in November, um, you can imagine the topics were really different than the ones that we wound up talking about. But we wound up moving it to a virtual meeting. It was really successful. And um, you all were played a big role in helping us to kind of figure out and shape the meeting. So we put together a couple of surveys, which 410 of you responded to. It was almost 100%. So um, really happy that you all participated. Um, some of the slides you see, the numbers are a little bit lower. We took these images about a week before our meeting, but since then, even more people have responded. And, um, so really appreciate that. So I'm just going to share with you what you shared with us um, that really gave us a lot of framework to work from when we were meeting last Friday. So the first one that I asked you all to respond to was whether or not you anticipated taking a grade option. Um, I know that you all know that you have a universal pass fail assigned right now and then you have the opportunity to opt in for grades in each one of your courses individually. So the question was, do, will you be taking a grade in all of your classes, some of your classes, prerequisites, and you can see your responses. So you can see what your, your uh, peers were also considering. And it looks like close to 60% of you um, are planning to take a pass or at least when you responded to the, or, or a grade um, when you responded to this in all of your classes. Um, and then another percentage of you, 13% or so, some of your classes, and then a group that said at least all of your prereqs. And we know that, you know, there may be some reasons why you changed that, but that was where your minds were at when we did the survey. Settling in well to online courses, about 45% said yes, 23% uh, said no, and uh, there were a group of people who responded who were not currently enrolled. 
And I know that my uh, other advisors in the office and I have been speaking with you and hearing, you know, a lot of those individual responses are a lot more like some classes better than others. Some classes are, are easier online than, than others. So I know that that's the survey is, is, you know, yes, but in a lot of cases, and we understand that. Um, we can go to the next slide. So this one was trying to get a snapshot of whether or not you all have had the opportunity to take a standardized test yet. And we did hear from the AAMC last week that about 25% of the people who were registered for any test date were scheduled during the dates that got canceled. So that is not a small percentage of people. For our College Park students, it looks like about 41% of you had had the opportunity to test. And then if you look at the responses below, if you did of that 41% have a chance to test, close to 16% of you were hoping to have the chance to test again. Um, it looks like as of Friday afternoon, the AAMC thinks that we will be having the opportunity to test this cycle. So I think that that's the good news and we're definitely gonna talk about timing, I know Dr. Kazad is gonna talk about that and how that will affect your applications this year. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So we asked the question if you considered changing your application timeline due to the pandemic and largely the answer is no. So 62% said no and then 30%, almost 31% said waiting to see whether or not you'll be able to test so I think that that means now that for a large percentage of that group, probably understanding that they should have the opportunity to test will probably continue on with their plans to apply. And a couple of people that I've talked to indicated that it's possible that while they were not planning to apply this year, they had everything ready to go, but they weren't gonna be ready to take the MCAT until later in the summer. A couple of people have even indicated to me they might apply this year. Those are conversations that Courtney and Nick and I are having a lot individually with everybody just trying to figure out, is this the best time? So we'll continue to have those conversations with you all. We can move on. And uh, so these last couple were really very specific. How has COVID been affecting you personally? So my family or my financial status has been affected and over half of you said yes. So I thought I would share that with you. And we do have some information probably that Dr. Kazada is gonna share are you, about um, the assistance and that sort of thing that we've learned. And moving on to the final slide. So the um, question, I or an immediate family member has tested positive and it looks, looks like almost 10% of you answered yes to that, uh, to that as well. And again, this was a snapshot about a week and a half ago, and we know this is a moving target. So I worry about you all. I hope everybody is as well as can be. And um, I and my team are gonna be in the chat box. So if you have specific questions for us, we can, we're here to try to answer them. But I know you have a lot of questions for the med school, and that's what all the students are here for and the rest of the team today. That's it. All right, yeah, all right. thanks so much, Wendy. Um, I, I have a feeling you're all probably very Zoom savvy already, but just in case, um, in case somebody hasn't done this already, if our faces on the side of your screen are getting in the way of you seeing the full slide, you can go to your view options. You can just hover your cursor towards the top of the screen and select the side-by-side -side view option, and then that way you'll be able to see the full slide. So um, with that, um, I wanted to kind of just cover what my objectives are for the time that we have left. And certainly what I wanna do is share with you what are the recommendations that we would always um, share with anyone who's interested in applying to medical school and what, we're, um, what we've always looked for, what we continue to look for. Um, and then also, and, and that would be certainly with respect to the content of applications, the timeline, We'll talk about interviews a bit. I do want to touch on curriculum because it's another important topic for Maryland this year. And then, of course, for all of these things, we're going to interject updates 
uh, and really kind of put it in the context of COVID and how that has changed some of the uh, recommendations that we would have normally given uh, because there have been some changes. Um, so to get started though, I'm gonna try to use a little technology here. So I'm gonna ask you to take out your phone. If you have a smartphone, um, open it up to the uh, camera option. And um, what I'm gonna do is start this here and give me one second here. There we go. All right, so uh, what I'm looking to do is to just kind of get a sense uh, for ev where everyone is. Um, can someone from the panel just confirm you can see the QR code on the top left of the screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So um, if you can just hover your camera from your phone over that QR code, and then you can just reply yes to the prompt. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> so, and you can en enter multiple times, um, you know, different things if you want, but. I'd Kind of want to get a sense of where people are. So yes, yeah, stressed is clearly, I think, uh, leading the pack here. Anytime there is uncertainty and um, change um, and disruption of what our normal routines are, that can be stressful. It can make us anxious. I think many of us are tired um, or even feel exhausted with how to adapt change. It takes energy to evolve and to do things differently than how you would normally do them. It, you know, oftentimes it takes longer to do things we would have otherwise done more efficiently. Um, I see some of you are worried and overwhelmed. It's hard to keep up with all the changes that are happening and um, you can't help but wonder how well we're gonna adapt to all these changes. I do see some positive though. I see some, I see some optimistic um, I see excited. I see uh, curious. I think curious is a good is a good place to be. Whenever there is uh, change and uncertainty, it's good to come from a place of curiosity and just wanting to learn and and sort of figuring out what we're all going to learn together from all of this. I I can certainly say our workload has increased in admissions, but at the same time, it's also been a tremendous learning process for many of us. Um, so I see, I see also some pretty goods, and then I see upset. I know that there have been many MCAT dates that have been scheduled, uh, rather canceled, and even a few more that were just canceled even this morning. So um, I just want to just take this moment just to acknowledge um, where everybody is right now, and that I'm aware, we are aware in admissions um, about how very stressful um, this time has been for so many people, especially for you, our applicants, um, and really throughout the timeline of the, the or pipeline, I should say, of the medical career. You know, we have our own students who are also stressed and anxious about what's going to happen with their testing dates. Um, and then there are physicians who are trying to figure out what's going to happen with their licensing exams. So you can see how everyone's impacted. But I really wanted to acknowledge how um, we understand that you all in particular have ample and many reasons um, to be frustrated and looking for answers. And I'm hoping that at least the more we communicate and work together, uh, we're going to help each other out through this uh, difficult time. So I have another question for you. This is a question that I always ask um, whenever I come to this group. I'm always curious to know who's, who's in the audience, you know, so just who is um, a first year or a, a sophomore um, who is getting ready to graduate. I see we have a pretty solid representation from folks who are getting ready to graduate, which is wonderful. Congratulations. And all right, that's a pretty nice split here. It's got still a few more people responding. Seems like a, uh, a nice linear correlation here. So the farther along in your studies you are, the more likely you're on this call. <laughs> Although I'm happy to see that there are uh, some freshmen and sophomore students um, as well, uh, because it's really never too early 
uh, to start learning about this process. And so, you know, I think the insight that you can get from this discussion will certainly be helpful to you as you're moving forward. So, all right, uh, thank you for participating in that one. I do have one more we'll do now um, because I think that this is helpful to see. And it's similar to um, one of the questions that you had answered for Wendy. I'm curious to see among this group of almost 300 people, how many of you are planning to apply this year? And it's the, clearly the, the vast majority of the group. So I think that's wonderful because obviously everything we talk about is going to be particularly relevant and pertinent to you and to hopefully answering your questions. But again, I am glad that there are some folks who are still um, considering either this year or next or clearly know that it's going to be in the future are also on the call. All right, very good. So I'm gonna come back to our PowerPoint and I'm gonna start first about, again, just covering what would be the typical and, and, and I think it's, even though it's the advice we give in, in nor, sort of quote unquote normal times, it's still very, very relevant and still very important that before you apply, that you really need to be clear on whether or not this is the right career for you. Um, your motivation um, really is so, so important. Um, it's a big decision. This isn't a decision to be made on a whim or to be taken lightly. It's not one that you should make to impress other people or to convince or please other people uh, for any reason. It really has to be something you need to decide for yourself and to understand clearly why. And I think at our core, we're all in this profession because you know, our why is that we wanna help others. You know, we wanna help people, um, but acknowledging that there's so many ways that you, one can be helpful. And I feel like what's happening in the world now is a wonderful a reminder of that. It's still, I think, that much more than important to clarify for yourselves why in this particular way um, do you want to help people? And um, and so is you know, do you have some exposure? Do you have we feel that it's important that you have some degree of exposure of what the actual work of a physician is in order to be able to answer that question. Um, I think that many of us probably had an idea or had an inclination to do this work before we had that exposure. But I would argue that for all of us um, who are in this work and already practicing in medicine, it was after we had that, that actual interaction and opportunity to see what it's really like that really kind of sealed the deal and made it that much more clear for us. So it's something to think about. And obviously, do you feel prepared and you're ready to embark on what will be undoubtedly a challenging career path that always has been. Hopefully you're here and you're thinking about this because you're up for that challenge. You're, you're looking forward to um, being challenged um, academically, but recognize that when we're challenged, it also sometimes can be physically demanding um, to be in medicine. I, I would actually argue residency for me was physically demanding when you're not having your normal sleep hours that you would have um, scheduled uh, if you had the choice. Um, and that can be emotionally demanding as well, certainly when you're um, caring for critically ill patients or helping families make very difficult decisions. These, these are, this is a demanding field on many levels. And so just kind of checking in on yourself and having that awareness that are you ready to take on those challenges? And um, this isn't a new thing I added to my slide. I've had this always here. I felt that it's very important. Um, resilience and adaptability are some characteristics um, that we look for actually uh, in our applicants because of the fact that medicine has always been challenging and you've always, um, we always feel that those students who do show that they can adapt to these unexpected twists and turns and can be resilient in the face of adversity are going to be more likely to be happy and successful in this career. And so before I forget to mention it, it's so, so important as you're working through these things and, and clarifying your motivation and whether and your readiness to work with your pre-med advisor. And this group in particular, um, I say this every year because it's true at College Park, I truly believe you have 
um, award-winning advising that's nationally among the best advising that you could have. So please do take advantage of that. Um, do not um, wait until the last minute, especially for those of you who are thinking about applying in the future. Um, if you haven't already gotten quite engaged with an advisor, you should do that. Um, so we talk about exposing yourself to um, the work of the physician and how important that will be in helping you decide your uh, career path. Um, you know, clinical exposure in particular is going to be really important. And I'm going to go ahead and just start off with acknowledging that we know that for many of you who were involved in some clinical activity where you maybe were getting very valuable exposure, that that would have been disrupted um, this semester, and that probably you won't be able to restart that over the summer um, if that were something that you were hoping to do, or that there may be significant delays in being able to do that. So know that we're aware of that, know that we uh, will be cognizant of that as we're reviewing applications. Hopefully for those of you who are applying this year and who said, I'm ready, this is my time, um, hopefully it means that you've had already the opportunity to get some of that uh, exposure in um, already, but we will even have a, a question on our secondary in case you want, we wanted to provide you a space so that if you wanted to, you could let us know if there were any activities that were disrupted and you didn't have the opportunity to see through the way you would have wanted to. You should, no one should feel obligated to answer that question. We're, we're doing that hopefully in a, just to give you more chances to, to let us know if there was something that you were hoping to do that you weren't able to do. And I, often get these questions about, you know, when you say get clinical exposure, what exactly are you talking about? And, and clearly any, anything that puts you in the medical setting, I would count as clinical exposure. Ideally, you'd be working um, with people and those could be patients, there could, they could be physicians, it could be other members of a care team. Um, but I think the ideal setting that we, we really like to see is um, those clinical experiences where you get a chance to observe the physician-patient relationship and that interaction and that bond. And a lot of the time that involves shadowing or scribing or even interpreter services. And again, we know that many of you maybe were involved in these sort of things and that were truncated or maybe were planning to do something and now it's questionable when you will be able to get it done. Um, I would argue that certainly for those of you who will be applying this year and maybe don't have the volume of numbers um, or hours rather that you were hoping for, I want to reassure you it's always been the case that we don't have a minimum number of hours. This isn't new. Uh, we've never put a big emphasis on the quantity of the time that you spend doing this, but really we focus more on the quality of that experience. And so how you describe that in your application is going to be so important because that's really the only way until we get to meet you that's really the only way that we're going to get to have that sense of how valuable the experience was to you and what you learned from it so i would um, encourage you not to worry too much about oh i didn't get this that number of hours i was hoping to do because i've heard that you need at least these many hours it, it's actually kind of a myth anyway we, we've never had a minimum number of hours i would say though you need some clinical exposure, even if it's a small number, something. I would be concerned, again, I as I mentioned before, this is a big deal. It's a big decision to make. And I would really be concerned about you choosing to follow career path in medicine, having had no exposure at all of what a physician does. So, so I'll just um, add that in. Another thing that we really value very much, so and like to see on an application is service, and particular service in the community. It doesn't have to be medically related service, uh, but really any, any uh, scenario in which you have an opportunity to engage with other people, and maybe it's even the other volunteers that you're working with or with the community members that you're serving, um, ideally, you're developing those skills and learning how to really communicate and interact um, effectively with people that maybe come from very different backgrounds or are living through very different life experiences than you have. That's um, 
A, it's great practice for medicine because that's essentially what you're doing as you're meeting patients and, and working with your teams, but it's also, I think, going to be hopefully very rewarding to you, and we want to see that. The reward that you get when you help somebody uh, through your service activities is going to be very similar to that reward you get when you are serving your patients. So medicine is by far a service profession, so we do look for that service inclination. This is another scenario where we've never had a minimum number of hours of service, and we also understand, and I think it's important to mention, that we know that even your service activities could have been truncated now. With social distancing, it's probably difficult to continue something that you were engaged in before. So we, again, know that those numbers will be smaller for these, um, for the spring, and probably also for the summer. We'll think about that. Um, what did I say in the in indicative activities interrupted? I think I meant to say they're in the secondary application, not in the MCAT. So in the in our secondary, again, you would you could if you wanted to go ahead and, and let us know if any of your service activities were cut short. Um, let's talk about academics. Um, so we always start off this conversation just you know kind of reinforcing that you know you should work hard in school stay focused as best you can remember that the studying and the time that you spend doing that the skills that you develop um, when you're studying and and really kind of dedicating yourself to academics is great training for medical school because medical school is hard and it's going to be very demanding it's harder i would say academically than undergrad and i went to grad school it was harder and more demanding than grad school so um so so that is you know an important factor too is to demonstrate um academic strength that said, you also see my COVID update here. We know that across the country, schools had to go to remote learning. Um, not everyone has had that same experience with remote learning uh, per se. And some institutions essentially went to a forced pass-fail grading for all of their students. Um, I know that at College Park, uh, you've been given the choice. So um, you can either choose a letter grade or you could choose to go pass-fail for your courses. Um, so we are accepting pass-fail uh, for both the spring uh, and summer semesters of 2020. We have already updated our website and MSAR um, to, to confirm that status. We're also accepting online courses, uh, which, you know, interestingly, not every medical school is accepting online courses. I kind of don't even really see how that's an option, but so we, we definitely are accepting online courses as well. So I wanted to reassure you about that. These are simply what the average um, GPA and the median MCAT score were for our uh, first year entering class. And as always, they really don't, I think, tell the whole story because they don't show the full breadth of the range of uh, GPAs and MCAT scores that we see. But um, you see that there's an asterisk here, both about talking about the pass fail grading and we are uh, certainly very aware, again, about the cancellations for the MCAT testing dates. Uh, and we understand that you all, many of you at least, have had to reschedule or are still waiting to reschedule. I know that they are not even allowing people to reschedule before May 7th, I believe. So um, we understand that MCATs are going to come later in the year um, than they normally would have. And we'll talk more about the MCAT. Um, just in general, for those few of you who haven't declared a major yet, I just wanted to throw in there like we normally do, you don't have to be a science major. Uh, we really like to see uh, diversity on many levels and even choosing your major is one of them. So we always say just choose the major that you love, that gets you excited. Uh, but hopefully you love science too and it also gets you excited because medical school is a lot of science. Um, you can always review our website to see what those uh, uh, course requirements are. Uh, but again, any of these can be done online, and we know that some of them have labs. And so if you had online labs, that's fine. We'll accept that credit. And if your lab was basically canceled or you weren't able to do that, we're willing to waive that lab requirement. Um, we've always been okay with um, AP credits, IB credits, community college credits for any of our prerequisites. 
Okay, so I wanna talk about this question about whether or not you should choose pass fail or a letter grade, because um, I think that this is probably something that Wendy, Nick, Courtney, Annie, everybody uh, gets asked a lot about, and you, you all answered that question uh, on that survey. It sounded like the majority of you, at least at the time that when you answered, were thinking about choosing a letter grade for most if, of your courses, or if not, at least for, your, uh, for those science and course requirements. So uh, a few things I want to emphasize here. Um, clearly, your GPA is just one small factor. It is a factor, but it is one factor of multiple things that we're looking for in the application. All these other things that I mentioned to you already, um, all are taken out and given equal weight. Um, so I think it's an important thing to, to take note of that. And we're also cognizant and aware that one grade or even potentially one semester really doesn't necessarily project what your academic potential is farther down the road in medical school. So we're aware of that and, and we'll be mindful of that for sure. And when I say that we're accepting pass-fail grades, I truly mean that as authentically as possible. We are accepting that. There are no conditions. Um, there's no setting in which if somebody chooses to go pass-fail grading that we would say, well, we're not going to consider them then for admission. So. Um, if some of you who maybe at some point were thinking letter grade or were now leaning towards pass fail or really wanted to do that, but are concerned that that would somehow eliminate you from consideration uh, at Maryland, that's not true. Even if you were thinking about doing that for your prerequisites. Um, I will say though, I think that uh, again, you'll have an opportunity if you felt the need to on the secondary. And that's not a new question. We've always had a space there uh, for you to be able to explain any area of academic difficulty at any point in your career. I mean, certainly things have happened before COVID, for sure. Um, I would say, though, even with that, with that reassurance, and I do want you to be reassured that you, you won't be disregarded if you choose pass-fail, I think the reason why probably so many of you have been considering or, or leaning towards choosing that letter grade um and uh you know and, and have gotten probably the advice to do that which was a good advice overall i would say the reality is um at least at maryland we do have that requirement that a course um that's required um would be considered um successfully completed or adequately completed at least if, you, if one earns a c or better um, and we're aware that a pass at uh, College Park could include a D um, or even a D minus, I believe. So in theory, um, there could be a question of whether or not that, um, whether or not that course was really passed and, and sort of that you really learned what you needed to uh, from that. We're not gonna automatically assume that you didn't. I do think though that it's, you know, only, realistic to know that um, you know across the country applicants are going to be applying at various points in their timeline there will be people who took years off there will be um, people who um, uh, you know are career changers etc so they may have you know complete transcripts that have all the letter grades um, and so I just sort of find it a little bit um, disingenuous to imply that if you have a, a large pool of candidates who have strong performances that you aren't going to, um, whether you do it consciously or unconsciously, maybe have a preference uh, for seeing letter grades in some of those important um, science courses. So I don't think that it's a bad idea to choose a letter grade for especially those prerequisites. Um, but again, if you decide um, at the last minute, and I know you have a pretty um, extended timeline to make that decision, um, if you choose uh, to go pass fail for any of your courses, that doesn't mean that we won't look at your application, okay? Um, I also, over email, have been getting a lot of questions from people about whether or not they should repeat a course if they choose a pass-fail. And to me, the only scenario, well, 
clearly, if you've got to fail, you should repeat that course. I mean, if it's a prerequisite, um, then you should. But I think if you got to pass, and I assume usually when people ask that question, it's because they got to pass, but they're not sure how that will be viewed. I think ultimately only you can decide between and working with your professor of that course and maybe working with your advisor about whether or not you need to take retake that course again only to make sure that you really need to have a firmer foundation in that content um, so if you um, sort of knew that you weren't doing so well um, in that area and you might need to strengthen that then that's something to consider but you shouldn't do it for us um, so if we see a pass on your uh, in any of your required courses we're not going to expect that then you retake it later at some other point for a grade. I think the reality is we may not have those luxuries. <laughs> so um, if you, no one should think that you're expected to retake a past course. Let's also talk about the MCAT because uh, there's a lot going on there. And I think um, you probably have gotten a lot of emails too and a lot of information, but I thought it would be good to cover. So we already know there were eight dates that were completely canceled from March 27th to May 21st. And then literally this morning, my understanding is that some testing centers for May 29th were also canceled and yet not all, which is interesting. A um, little bit frustrating, um, but I suppose that's the reality of the world that we're in right now. So again, a lot of uncertainty. Um, one thing that I do know that they've stressed over and over again is that they are doing their darndest to try to make sure they are expanding the testing availability so that everybody who wanted to take a test this cycle has the opportunity to do that. Um, so um, they did, uh, between this time period of May and, and late September, add three additional testing dates. And instead of the usual, I think, two opportunities to test, there's now going to be three appointments per date. Um, and um, I mentioned already test registration uh, will open on the 7th. I guess they've had to pause allowing people to do that in order to coordinate all those additional dates. But another important thing, if you hadn't heard already, is in order to make those three testing times available, per day, they're also temporarily shortening the MCAT itself. So instead of being a seven and a half hour exam, it will be a five hour exam and 45 minutes, so just short of six hours, um, which I gotta say, that last hour is often a doozy. So I, I do think that while clearly, I think they did it for logistical reasons, I think that, that that's a nice bonus that one gets out of this. So I wanted to share that. That said, it's intended to cover the same content. So you wouldn't study for it or prepare for it any differently. And the scoring scale will still be the same and we'll still have the four sections. Um, so you would get five total scores, right? One for each of the four sections and then a total score um, for the whole exam. And another thing that's really important to us is that rather than taking the usual four weeks um, that they typically take to turn around the score and, and get them out to the schools, they've committed to getting this to us within a two week time frame. So they really are trying to keep up with the timeline as best they can in terms of what we would normally hope for. And of course, um, they're understanding that testing is expensive and it's not your fault that you need to reschedule. And sometimes some of you had maybe rescheduled multiple times. So I know that they've waived rescheduling fees at least starting from April 1st. And this is a um, for the foreseeable future uh, scenario. I, I do just got to mention some, some question about research because people often ask about this. We don't at Maryland require research when you're applying for the MD program. Um, it is, however, expected that you would have some research activity if you're applying for one of the combined degree programs. Um, so it's possible that other medical schools require research even for their MD only, but we don't. That's not a make or break situation like the clinical experience or the service in the community. Of course, if you have research, it's always nice to see, and you can certainly add that 
um, in your application. But again, that wouldn't be one where you would um, not be reviewed if you don't have research already. And um, it's possible if you're kind of not decided about combined degree. I know that there have been some students that choose to do that later and maybe even as a medical student. Actually, I decided to get a master's after my residency. So um, you know, there's a lot more flexibility, I think, with that sort of thing than people realize. Um, but we clearly understand as well that the research activities over this time period is going to be um, not as robust as it normally would have been. Um, Normally, I just, I just wanted to cover what are some of the other kind of themes and things that we like to see in an application. Uh, we like seeing you being engaged and involved in the student groups that you might have on campus, um, events going on in the community. Um, I know that some of our committee members like to see sort of leadership qualities. I, I think even more important than that is teamwork. And so whether that's you're leading a team or you're just a great team player, and I think that that's a really important thing because in medicine we work in teams. So um, really kind of think about that as you're reflecting on your experiences and activities that you've had. I think um, highlighting that and even uh, as you're describing your experiences, considering how valuable those experiences have been in teaching you how to collaborate and work with others and be part of a team is, is an important thing. And um, obviously not a requirement, but we are interested in seeing what kind of work you've been involved in. And if you've had any paid employment, there will be a space on the secondary for you to share. But even in the primary, you should put that as one of your activities. Um, you know, it's another opportunity to learn how to engage and interact effectively with people, right? So we love it if you've, you know, you've been a server or, you know, you're in the retail or whatever the case may be, you have to learn to, talk to people and, and sometimes uh, mitigate uh, challenging or difficult situations, upset clients, that sort of thing. That's, those are all useful skills that you'll use in medicine. Another reason why it's important though to let us know about that is that could also sometimes be competing for your time and we understand that um, maybe you haven't had as many service hours, for example, because you've been working and, and you, you've needed to have that income. So we certainly do, as part of our holistic review, consider that as well. So I'm um, gonna touch on the application process. So uh, the AMCAS has not changed the timeline. They want to push forward and stick to the timeline that we've always had. I think that's not unreasonable because hopefully, again, most people who were ready and planning to apply this year are pretty much geared up and ready to go. Um, so we know that the primary application for AMCAS will open on May 4th, and then they will start allowing submissions, I believe, on uh, May 28th. Now, we've always had this sort of normal um, or typical recommendation to apply early because we have rolling admissions. Again, I do want to stress, though, that we get that the timeline this year is going to be different. And in fact, um, you know, we are going to have to be pretty flexible and rolling with how the applications come in. I think at this point, we're just going to have to wait and see who um, is ready to go and who needs more time. So I don't think this is going to be a scenario where, you know, it's so significant if you were submitting something in September, for example, compared to if you submitted by uh, June, um, but the reality is because we have rolling admissions, as we are getting applications, we will be able to review your application earlier if you submit it earlier. So I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, I certainly wouldn't submit if you don't believe you're ready. Um, but if you are ready, I would say to go ahead and move forward with the timeline that you had originally planned. Um, many of you are aware, I'm sure, that the primary is going to share transcripts and, in theory, MCAT scores, uh, and then, of course, all of those descriptions and a letter from uh, your, the committee letter from your advising office. Um, our deadline has always been November 1st for the primary, so at this point, we're hoping that November 1st is enough time for people to get that primary application in. So we haven't chosen to extend that at this point. Um, of course, I think we've all learned that things can change, so I'm not saying that that's um, 
not something that might get revisited at some point later, but I, I, I'm hopeful and, and I think that it's more likely that we will be able to stick to that November 1st date. Um, and it's always been true that at Maryland, you can submit your, and everywhere, you can submit that primary application before you've taken the MCAT. Um, it's always been the case, and probably this year, we're all expecting that most of you will be doing that, given that you've, you're all waiting to take your MCAT later than you originally uh, were planning to do that. So I, you know, I think that that would probably be a wise choice to go ahead and submit. And I think a really important point to make here, and I know there were some questions in the chat already about this, is that yes, we are prepared to go ahead and begin screening and making decisions to extend interviews without an MCAT if that becomes necessary. Um, again, I know that at uh, the AAMC, they're working very hard to make sure that everybody who wants to take the MCAT can take it. Um, but I think we still will have to wait and see what ends up really happening with respect to the timing of that. And do we want to necessarily delay things um, that much farther with at least starting our interview process if folks are still waiting for their MCAT. So I want you to know that uh, we are poised and positioned and ready to be able to um, move forward so that we can keep to that timeline, even if we have to make uh, interview offers without an MCAT. Um, we actually don't do any screening between the primary and the secondary. So if you submit a primary to us, you will get a secondary automatically. It, it, um, there's a space if you want to include a, a photo. Um, and then in terms of your um, descriptions, you know, we have some questions there. We're going to ask you about your most valuable clinical experience and service experience, we're looking for more um, insight into uh, why that was your most valuable experience. So I, I, I think it's a pet peeve for many of us on the admissions committee, if you're just copying and pasting the description on the primary, that um, isn't as well received. So, so I invite you to reflect even more deeply and, and share some more about that experience and particularly why out of all your experiences that was the most meaningful one for you. Um, our deadline currently for the secondary application is December 1st. Um, we haven't changed it yet, but again, depending on how things go, we could revisit that. So I actually invite all of you just to kind of regularly check our website because we're going to keep um, updates on the website uh, in case any of these deadlines change. So I think this year, more than any year, even though it's been the case every year, uh, that how you explain your motivation to us in your personal statement, how you describe your activities, all of that has always mattered, you know, the descriptions on your secondaries. Um, but I think it matters even more now. Uh, if you, for example, can't, um, you know, rely on this, this huge, actually, I don't think anyone could ever rely on numbers. I, we always found it a little bit frustrating and kind of disheartening. Um, when people, for example, had maybe hundreds of hours of, say, shadowing, but all they put in the description was just the name of the person they shadowed and, a, you know, the hours and a phone number for contact. And, and we see that all the time. We see people that just put name, hours, and phone number, and so forth. And it's just like this list. And I'm like, ah, oh, what a missed opportunity, right? What you really want to do here is give us some qualitative information, some context of um, what you experienced during that activity. We care so much more about that than about the number of hours that you spent. So more than ever, um, take advantage of those spaces to share that. Um, uh, your letters of recommendation tell us uh, something hopefully about you too. And so you really wanna seek out um, people who know you, um, somebody who knows you well, it doesn't have to be the chair of a department or even the PI of that lab that you work with that you interacted with very little. Make sure that the person writing your letter is someone that can really vouch for you and is going to be an advocate for you because they know you and we can tell when they know you. So make sure um, that those are the folks that you reach out to. And we understand that there could be some delays in the letter. So we're not going to also, again, we're prepared to screen applications maybe before all of the letters are in. That said, I think that, um, or I know that, uh, again, here's another space where you're in a, in a good place because you have a 
uh, pre-health advisory office that's on the ball and I think ready to get those committee letters together. But if there are delays, uh, that's something that we will be flexible about. When you do get that invitation to uh, come in for an interview, you will control the date that you come in. You get to select your interview date. So I would just encourage you, as you can, to try to pick an earlier date rather than the latest date because, again, of the rolling admissions process. Um, and we are actively looking at the possibility of remote interviews because we understand that um, you know, some schools actually had to do that already this year. Uh, we were fortunate in that we were able to finish all of our interviews before social distancing, but we have no guarantees that that won't be the case again in the fall. So we are looking at that. Whether you do it in person or you do it over a Zoom call, um, make sure that you dress professionally and you present yourself every time you interact with either in person, over email, over the phone, um, as presenting yourself as professionally as you can with any member uh, from the admissions office. And we, our, our um, interviews will still be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We're not moving to the multiple mini interview. We just want to get to know you as a person. We'll talk to you about what you've shared on your application. Um, so uh, just uh, be yourself and be ready to discuss what you've shared with us in the application. Um, just a few comments on curriculum before I'm going to open it up for some more uh, discussion. But I do think it's important that we talk about it just because, you know, before COVID-19, 2020 was still a big year for us in admissions because we've been working for uh, actually a couple years now on uh, launching our curriculum renaissance, which um, is going into effect this year in August. And so I really love the, the mission of this curriculum, which is actualizing the Renaissance physician. We're training lifelong learners who are clinically excellent and possess humanism, professionalism, scholarship, leadership, critical thinking skills, and attention to social justice and diversity. Uh, probably I'll just highlight a few major um, larger or more meaningful changes. One is that uh, historically what we've had at Maryland was a full two-year pre-clinical uh, pre curriculum where in the first year you learn sort of normal anatomy and physiology and then in second year you would learn more about disease processes and pathophysiology and you go by system. Um, and that can be a little bit redundant so we're moving toward this integrated system-based um, curriculum where you are going to learn both the normal and the abnormal anatomy and physiology and function of the body as well as treatment processes and interventions um, that medicine has to offer right away even as early as a first year so you really start to think um, like a clinician um, as you are just beginning your career so I think it's really exciting I also think another nice thing about that is because we're doing this integration it's more efficient so it means that we'll end all that preclinical study and learning earlier in your career and you therefore can start your clinical rotations earlier in the process so rather than waiting until july of your third year you would presumably be able to maybe take step one for example in march and then in april or may you would begin your uh, clinical rotation so you'll get a few extra months there of opportunities to uh, consider other specialties, for example. Uh, so I mentioned that already. Another neat thing that we're doing, which we've already started doing now, and we're just gonna continue to flush it out even further, is uh, what we're calling sort of back to basics in the fourth year. So let's say as a fourth year student, you already know that you're going to be a neurologist and you're getting ready for your neurology residency application. Um, it's a nice opportunity for you to kind of go back and revisit some of those basic science uh, concepts that you learned as a first year. Maybe you want to review the brain anatomy. Maybe you want to review some of the neurophysiology uh, and pathophysiology um, so you can get involved in research in that area. So th there's going to be opportunities to tailor that in to really sort of fine tune your preparation for your future career. Another opportunity to do that is what we call intern prep camp. Uh, which, as I said, uh, we've already begun doing, and it's a nice way to also refresh yourself on all those really clinical skills and tools that you need to be a really effective 
intern and resident, et cetera. And we're recognizing that some skills are specific to certain specialties. So um, we're gonna continue to amplify and include more and more specialty specific boot camps that you can take towards the end of your fourth year. And I have to say that we always get amazing feedback about how well clinically trained our graduates are. So I really feel like this is just building on that, enhancing it even further. We, we've had these elective tracks in the past and we're going to preserve them. So we'll still have a primary care track, the medical Spanish program. Uh, CAP is an acronym that stands for the Combined Accelerator Program in Psychiatry. Um, we'll continue to have the Humanism Symposium, the Social Justice Track, and the Genetics Consortium. Um, I, I should mention too that not only do you get to jump into the clinical rotations earlier, but there is more flexibility presumably with step one study preparation. Um, so rather than four to six weeks, you might need eight weeks, for example, or 10 weeks even to prepare for your step one. There will be more flexibility to do that. Um, and something we've always done and we will continue to do is to really meaningfully um, ask our students how we're doing and get feedback about what are continual improvements that we can do to tweak things as we move forward. And students have always had a place on our curriculum committees um, and we have town halls and we have um, online forums where students can answer questions if they have questions after a lecture, for example, and there's ongoing discussion. So there's a lot of opportunities as a student to communicate with the leadership uh, and also to even um, really help shape the curriculum. We actually had students be very uh, much a part of this process as we've been working towards the curriculum renaissance. And as I said, we'll continue to do that. So that's all the prepared um, material that I had for you. I know it's a lot, um, but I wanted to um, open it up because I know that there's been a lot of chatting going on in the chat box, which is wonderful. I love that this is a very um, engaged group that has a lot of uh, questions and that there's been a lot of discussion. I want to thank all of our panelists and people who have been helping out with answering these um, questions. And I'm going to ask um, either Dr. Robinette or Ms. Kareem if there were uh, particularly any questions you noticed in the chat that you think we should discuss with the group as a whole. Um, that would be great, let me know. Okay, let me know if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, still saying my internet connection is unstable for some reason. Um, I, you know, I think that there have been a few themes in the chat box. A major one has kind of been MCATs, um, whether or not we're delaying reviewing applications based on when people take their MCATs. I think at this point, we're certainly flexible and we can't give 100% certain answers, but we anticipate that we will have we will primarily be reviewing applications that have all their MCATs in and everything else. We do review applications through December. So people have time um, and we look at the whole application, we'll look at your MCATs and everything else. Um, certainly the sooner you can get your application in the better, but don't worry that if you take your MCAT in July, you'll be right there with kind of the, the beginning of people who we're, uh, whose applications we're reviewing. Um, there's another question about if you take this kind of shortened MCAT, whether or not that would be perceived poorly in the future if you decide not to apply until next year's cycle. And I doubt that will be the case at this time. I mean, there's just so much going on and, and a lot shifting. So I don't think we'll look at those scores any differently at this point. Um, Let me, I just want to, sure. before you go to, and I just want to add to, I agree with everything Dr. Robinette said. Um, so I'll answer in, reverse order, um, clearly no one is going to look at you with side eye that you took the MCAT during the COVID pandemic. If anything, we're all going to be very understanding and very impressed that you were able to stay focused and prepare and take an exam with all these moving parts and so many things going on. No one is going to say, oh, well, they the easy MCAT. There is no such thing. Um, so uh, don't worry about that at all. Um, no, I, there would be no expectation that because it was the quote unquote shorter, and it's still not short, you know, six hours, just under six hours is still not short. It is, I think, nice that it's a little bit shorter. Um, but we certainly, uh, I, I would say, don't worry about that at all. I, I can tell you, I've been on many, many 
webinars and phone calls and working with many uh, admissions officers from across the country, if there is a common theme that we all are on the same page about is that we all know you all have it really rough right now, that we feel for you and that we want to be flexible and understanding uh, with what you're going through. So don't, don't worry that that would be the case. And um, there was, what was the first one about the later MCAT? The first one was they were, there's a lot of questions and, and I'm summarizing a few different questions about whether or not um, we would be reviewing applications without MCATs if they weren't taking oh. their MCATs this summer, whether or not that put them right. at a timeline disadvantage. So um, that's, that's good. So it reminded me that I wanted to say earlier in the presentation, so I'm glad you asked that question. Um, or those questions that we've always had on our secondary, a question that asks, are you planning to take an upcoming MCAT? And then you would indicate the date that you're planning to take it. So uh, what we'll continue to do is by having that question there, if you indicate to us that you have an upcoming MCAT date that you're you know, hoping, fingers crossed, that you're gonna be able to take that MCAT on that date, we will wait and we will hold uh, until you've taken that MCAT. Um, because to me, the assumption is if you're telling me, wait, I have another MCAT that I want to take and I want you to see that before you make any decisions, then I will respect your request to do that. So if you let us know that yes, you're planning to take another MCAT, then we will wait and we've always done that. We've always waited for that um, upcoming MCAT if you let us know that you are planning to take another one. Um, anything else or Rashana, do you have any? Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the elective tracks? Someone said it sounds very interesting. Just, uh, any of the, any of them in particular or they didn't well, say, okay, I'll just share. Sure. Um, okay. they are interesting. <laughs> i actually, <laughs> why don't we invite, um, I know Sydney, do you want to talk about medical Spanish? Oh, were you also in primary care track or no? Okay. Uh, no, I wasn't in primary care track, but I did take medical Spanish. Um, I had, so just as a background, I had, um, I was a Spanish major at College Park. So it was something that I wanted to continue at Maryland and um, especially use it with uh, Spanish speaking patients. I thought that it was a skill set that I really wanted to continue. Um, so essentially, the um, the tract is with is led by Dr. Quesada, so it's really cool to spend some time with her. Um, and we met uh, about once a week, and we would learn. And first year, we would learn um, some of the vocabulary and um, common phrases to use for working with Spanish-speaking patients. And we would also learn, and it sort of parallels the the class that we have called Intro Introduction to Clinical Medicine. I'm not sure if it's changed in the new curriculum, but the way that we had it, first year we would learn how to take a history, and then second year we would learn how to do a, how to do a physical exam. And so the Med Spanish class sort of correlated uh, with what we were learning in our ICM courses. So we would be learning how to take a history in Spanish, and then we would learn how to do a physical um, in Spanish. And at the end of the year, we would uh, practice those on uh, what we call standardized patients. So actors who come in and present a clinical problem to us and just so that we could get used to speaking with people and interacting and showing empathy while practicing our like doctoring skills. Um, and then another really cool thing is we do a lot of um, volunteer work uh, in the Spanish speaking community in Baltimore. So there's a lot of um, opportunities, especially with like some of our other uh, interest groups like the Latin, Latin American Medical Student Association or SNMA, um, where we would work at um, health fairs th throughout Baltimore. Um, and there's also a, a clinic called St. Clair's Medical Outreach Clinic. It's in um, Lutherville, which is only like 15, 20 minutes away from Baltimore. And it's affiliated with the University of Maryland. So we would and it services, I would say like 95% of their patients are Spanish speaking. So um, as a fourth year, during one of my electives, I was actually able to go and work in that clinic um, and see patients. So 
it's really, it was a really cool way to continue learning how to adapt my Spanish skills to a really underserved patient population. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, yeah, I, I'll just add a few comments just in general about all the elective tracks. I mean, I think that they're they're um, all very unique, and you know, some of them are four-year experiences, some of them are one or two-year experiences, some are just a semester. So there's a lot of differences and uniqueness. Um, all of them, I think, are really great ways to. Um, you know, explore some different uh, clinical skills even more deeply. Although you're going to you're going to be able to do that even without being in them, it's just like additional time that you get to spend doing that. Um, and you can overlap them. Uh, so I do have I have had students that were in medical Spanish that were also in the primary care track or who also did the social justice track. Um, I'll be honest with you, I always wonder how they do that because honestly, medical school just all by itself is enough to keep anybody busy, but um, we do have students that are able to do that. So they're not mutually exclusive. And we don't expect you to commit to any of them as soon as you come in the door. Uh, in fact, we usually wait until after you've had your first exam. And then we sort of um, open up availability to uh, consider signing up for one of these uh, tracks. So thanks again, Sydney. And actually, if there are any question, more questions for the students, um, I would love to give them some more chances to answer. Um, sorry, I actually see a question asking if you need a background in speaking Spanish to do the Spanish elective. That's and a great question. Yeah. You do have to have sort of a baseline um, skill set in Spanish. Um, Dr. Quesada will send out a sort of little quiz um, with uh, questions on Spanish grammar, and um, she'll have you write a little bit, a little essay in Spanish about why you want to take the track. Um, and she'll review those and see if your skill set um, sort of matches what she's looking for for the elective. Yeah, I do. I, um, I need the, our students to have at least sort of a conversational intermediate level of Spanish proficiency because of the fact that you are also going to have some real world application of those skills and you're going to be in a clinic and working with patients and that interaction that you have them with you know impacts their experience there at the clinic and so we want to make sure that you're in a position to be able to do that and we're building on uh, what you have with medical terminology and with some clinical knowledge and and clinical skills as well we we, we kind of talk you through how you would talk your patient through a physical exam etc so um, that said, I think it's important to also note, because um, Sydney mentioned like the LMSA or the Latino Medical Student Association um, does also run a, a student run, I sort of call it the sister course for medical Spanish. So it's basically a medical Spanish course that's open to all students of all levels. And um, they meet fairly regularly, I think about once a month maybe, and have an opportunity to you know, brush up on your skills, oftentimes review a lot of the same materials that we're doing in medical Spanish. So there's something for everyone. Also I think there's questions. a lot of questions just looking at the Q&A box because we kind of have two things here for the students. There's a few questions asking about how you got involved with research, if you've been able to complete any research projects, um, or, and how you found the mentors that you worked with. Those are great questions. Um, in terms of research, uh, I guess I can say that um, it's been extremely easy uh, finding mentors um, and people that are just super available to do research. So I haven't had any problems getting plugged in um, with mentorship opportunities and research opportunities um, in uh, whatever field um, that, that I was interested in. Um, I would say that a lot of the faculty here, a lot of the students find faculty um, that were like lecturers, that were lecturers or like the people that um, you regularly interact with and then maybe something uh, interesting in their research um, kind of caught your eye and then people contact them. Um, and so, you know, there's a bunch of, there's tons of ways to get involved in different research opportunities and I think uh, everyone finds a pretty good fit for them here. Um, and the faculty are really, uh, they're very welcoming and they have a very good open door policy in terms of discussing uh, whichever research that they have. Um, and so there's definitely been no issues with that, I would say.
There's also um, an entire office of student research that's dedicated to helping match you with mentors in your area of interest. Um, we have a research requirement as medical students here. So after my first year, I did a program called PRISM, uh, uh, it, which is sort of facilitated through the University of Maryland. And they um, match you with, like you work specifically with a mentor off, like and you can find these mentors on big lists that the Office of Student Research gives you. Um, so on the preclinical side, it's really easy to connect with um, faculty, especially if you go to the interest meetings, say like there's a med peds interest group or an ortho interest group or a trauma interest groups, and they will hold like meetings uh, at the lunchtime and they'll often have faculty who are like, hey, you want to do research? I have a project for you. Um, so it's re they're really approachable, like Emil said. And then on the clinical side, if you happen to do an elective that you're interested, for, for example, I'm interested in GI. And so I was on my GI elective and all the fellows are like, hey, here's the project, you should do it. And so, um, and like once you start working with them, they'll connect you with more and more people. So it's once like you make one connection, it's really easy to get the ball rolling and just go from there. Excellent. And you also just, my heart just grew a little bit bigger when you said you're interested in GI. Just, just want to say that. <laughs> any other, uh, any other questions? Yeah, there's a question about uh, community service. So I was going to see if maybe Cameron wants to talk about his service, his community service that he did. Sure. John. And Helen. Sure, I could. Sure, I could talk about that. Um, so I'm involved with the uh, Cure Scholars Program, um, which is a uh, program that the University of Maryland School of Medicine runs um, for uh, sixth through eighth grade students um, from the West Baltimore area middle schools. Um, basically, what we do in that program, um, we get actually paired with a men mentee one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and throughout the program, we help them first, it's very structured. So we have um, homework help for like the first part of the program. Um, and then we have the opportunity to um, help them with STEM projects. So um, they, they have anatomy track, they have a, like a computer science track and a bunch of different tracks for the students to get involved in. Um, they complete a poster project at the end of the year. Um, as well, throughout the program, they have some really cool um, opportunities. So I got to go on a field trip with the students um, to the hospital um, where one of the urologists taught the students how to use the Da Vinci surgical machine, uh, which is really cool. Um, so I, 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 that was one of the um, things that actually attracted me to University of Maryland was the involvement um, in service um, and not only at a student level, but also um, there's a lot of faculty who are involved in, in serving the community. Um, and I really think the school is a very good citizen of the West Baltimore uh, community being very, very involved in, in improving the area. So um, I think that's a major uh, plus of the school. Awesome. Um, I definitely want to echo everything that Cameron has mentioned. Um, I think for me, service was one of the most important things that I wanted to continue um, throughout my four years in medical school. It kind of helped me keep me grounded and better um, kind of understand the background of the patient populations that um, we were serving at the medical center. So um, one of the things that um, I was able to get involved with was uh, something called the Reads for Peds program. Um, so that was an organization where we kind of fundraised, wrapped, and distributed um, books to kiddos um, who were staying in the hospital or visiting the hospital over the holidays. And it was just a really great way for students, um, faculty, residents, et cetera, um, to kind of get involved and do something really wonderful for the community in an informal setting. Um, some of the other examples of uh, service experiences that are available to students include the um, Project Feast. Um, initiative, which is um, an annual event that's been going on for almost 30 years, um, hosted by uh, University of Maryland. And um, what we do is we kind of help prepare uh, Thanksgiving meals uh, for the West Baltimore community. And um, it's hosted annually at a middle school where, you know, people can come in, have a wonderful meal, and also um, kind of pick up any uh, clothing donations or any other items that they might need um, to gear up with the winter season. So um, there are just so many different opportunities available to you, whether it's kind of long term, short term. Um, and yeah. Thanks, Helen. There's, um, I don't know if um, anybody else, any other students were, were involved in any of the um, elective tracks, but somebody was asking about social justice. Was anybody involved in social justice? 
And if I, the other question that came up, and it came up a couple of times, is just the timelines of these tracks. So some of them kind of run throughout, like primary care and uh, our psychiatry interest. Others, I, I believe humanities, is, uh, the um, humanism is you can take it first year or second year. Medical Spanish, is that one year? It's one year now. Yeah. Oh, it's one year now. <laughs> um, <laughs> two years, I changed it because of the curriculum change. So now it's one year. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions about like how many you can take. Like if you start one and you don't love it, can you switch to another one? I don't know if any of the students have any comments about that. Um, Like if you did different ones during first and second year, like if you did one first year or, and then got involved with something else your second year. Yeah, so I was I took med, well medical Spanish was two years when I took it, so I uh, kind of I sort of myself personally I was struggling a little to figure out how to study in the first parts of first year. So I and I like really wanted to do the med Spanish track, so I decided. That was the one that I was going to pursue, and I did that. Um, but I also took a second elective my second year. Um, it was called Critical Issues in Healthcare, um, and it's all it's through our school of law. So it was a really cool opportunity to get to talk to students from the nursing school, the um, uh, social work school, um, and sort of be interdisciplinary in our study of medicine. Um, and so I think uh, you really just have to like think about how you're adjusting to med school because everyone's um, adjustment period and journey is different and figure out how you how much you feel like you can handle or um, while still it's I think first and second year are a little difficult uh, because you have I don't, I don't know if the new curriculum changes changes anything but we had a class until noon every day, and then your entire afternoon is free to plan how you want, but there's still constant pressure to be studying, to be keeping up, and, and to do self-care, and, um, you know, engage in the community, and there's, like, all of these hats that you have to put on, and so um, for me, it took me a while to figure out how much time I wanted to devote to wearing each hat, so, um, I think if you, unless you're interested in a truck that's two years, and I don't know if any of them are given the new curriculum, um, but if you are interested in say two trucks that are one year, then definitely start with one and then add this other one in on in the second year once you've sort of caught your groove a little bit. Thank you for those points, Sydney. You, you like brought up so many things. <laughs> um, and I think one thing that's important that she said is just sort of gauging and giving yourself space to get adjusted and to really have some awareness about how much really additional free time you feel like you, you have to pursue other interests. Somebody already mentioned some interest groups and there are literally like 40 different activity interest groups. So that's like another uh, potential um, area that you're going to dedicate some of your time in. So you will get guidance on the, not only the difference in the timeline, but even the level of time commitment that each of these different specialties are. So if it looks like you're kind of overdoing it and you're signing up for too much and it's, um, there are some restrictions uh, because some of them are so time intensive. Um, so, you know, we, we will make sure that our students, as they're coming in as first years and getting ready to start making those decisions, that you have that information so you can uh, make thoughtful decisions. I also appreciate that Sydney uh, brought up the critical issues in healthcare course because that's, that wasn't on my slide. So we do have some of these neat interprofessional courses. Another one is critical issues in global health, and that's in conjunction with the School of Nursing. So it's a unique thing about our school being on this interprofessional campus that you also do have uh, opportunities to learn with other um, students in health professions and, and other professions like law. So, all right, anything else? I'm sure there's more. Yeah, I was gonna say, again, for the students, um, there are two different questions. One asked if any of you guys wanna talk about your thought process behind if you took any gap time in what you did. And there's another question about whether or not this pandemic, um, I, it was well asked, kind of like solidified your interest in medicine or gave you pause about your decision to go to medical school? So there are two separate questions. I'm sorry. 
Um, I'd be happy to kind of share a little bit about like the first question that you mentioned. Um, uh, so I did take a gap year um, between college and medical school, and I thought it was one of the best decisions of my life. Um, part of the reason why I wanted to take a gap year, year because um, I wanted to gain additional clinical exposure, and I really wanted to kind of solidify my understanding of medicine and what it entailed, like um, Dr. Quezada had mentioned that it's um, super um, important to do. So um, during that gap year, I was able to uh, work as a scribe in a plastic surgeon's office, and it gave me the opportunity to work with uh, multiple different providers. I got to learn a lot of different uh, styles when it came to interviewing patients or performing physical exams, and I got to kind of have some early exposure to medical terminology, which was really helpful as well. Um, during my gap year, um, because I had an early interest in pediatrics, I also volunteered at Children's National in D.C., um, kind of I mentioned earlier that service is something that's near and dear to my heart so I thought it was a really great way to kind of um, you know devote time to kind of increasing my clinical exposure and kind of working on other aspects but also you know fostering my um, passion for that so um, I did that for the majority of the year and um, towards the end I was able to actually spend some time just visiting my family that um, abroad that I hadn't seen in many years so um, I'm really grateful that that gap year gave me the opportunity to kind of you know um, work on so many different avenues because it was a great experience. Thank you Helen. Anybody else want to mention, I guess, the anyone thought about? I, I have to think that with what's going on with the pandemic, it's made you think about your, your decision maybe in a different way or just in a new way. Um, does anyone want to chime in on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can definitely say it's strengthened um, my resolve and kind of confirmed the fact that this is probably that I mean this is what I wanted to do um, I think that just having an inside look at you know what all of our faculty are doing every single day and you know how they kind of all bend it together um, and changed so many operations um, set and had so many different sacrifices in their own professional and personal lives um, you know they it, it really made me think about you know what what an important role a physician has um, within the care of a patient, especially within this time. Um, and, you know, it's been really inspiring actually to just watch the entire process uh, kind of go down um, and see how we've been able to react and see how, um, how some of the skills that we learned in medical school, like are being very well like put into use. Um, and, you know, just being able to recognize all the science and all the medicine that's been happening. Um, I think it's been really powerful and, and you know, definitely I can, I guess, speak for myself and a lot of people in my class who are itching to get involved um, in any way possible. Um, you know, it's definitely been uplifting for us to see uh, that we can have, that we can make such a large difference in people's lives. Yeah, I agree with Emil. I think um, I entered medical school um, because the humanism, humanistic side of medicine appealed to me. Um, and I think that's what, um, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really like the first two years of med school. They were really stressful for me. There was a lot of like science involved, like a lot of basic science that, um, you know, was a little bit dry. But when I got to third year of med school and I was on the wards and I was actually interacting with patients, that really reaffirmed like, I made the right choice to like pursue an MD instead of like a PhD or something else. Um, and I think uh, a lot of what I learned from my attendings and from a lot of the residents and fellows that I've worked with over the last few years um, it is the role of the physician in comforting, in educating, in um, alleviating concern or worry or anxiety in the patient. Um, and really about the human connection. And so, um, I don't know, just being at home, talking to a lot of my family members who are like, wow, you must be really scared or you must be really, um, it's like such a bad time to start internship. Um, and I've been sort of taken aback by those comments because for me at least, and I know for a lot of people in my class, um, uh, 
we can't wait to be to start our internships in June or July because um, we feel like we've worked so hard to develop this skill set and to be an asset to people to comfort them and to make them feel better and to um, reassure them as much as we can uh, with information and knowledge. Um, so I think reflecting on that during this time has really made me more excited to become a doctor. And I get to stay at Maryland, so. Yay! Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, have to, I have to comment that I think a lot of us in, um, you know, in the academic leadership team at Maryland are hopeful that our curriculum renaissance is going to make those first couple years much less on the dry side. It's going to be hopefully more exciting and much more clinically relevant by integrating um, that first and second year content. So, um, and I, I agree. I, I agree with everything both Emil and Sydney said. Um, I, I'm actually going to, I want to hear from Dr. Robinette too, but I'll just say as a gastroenterologist, um, it's interesting because, well, actually COVID does have uh, some GI symptoms, but clearly this is not a primary GI process, but my patients, uh, you know, I specialize in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, they're on immune suppression. So they had a lot of questions about what their risks are going to be for infection, having their immune systems um, suppressed by the medications that they're on. Um, and so there, it's absolutely been a reminder of just how you know, life-changing those interactions are that you have with your patients to reassure them, to guide them, to keep them safe and keep them healthy. And uh, in the times when I have had to go in into the clinical setting, I remember the very first time that I went back in after the initial sort of everybody go home thing, um, you couldn't help but be a little bit sort of just a little nervous to be like, well, how's, what's going to happen? How's this going to be different? And then as soon as I walked in and, and started doing the work, it just felt good and right. And it was just like, it, it, with all the uncertainty and all the things we don't know um, about yet, um, if there's one thing that as a physician you do know how to do, it's you know how to take care of patients. And when you step into that setting, um, there's comfort in that too. And knowing that um, you, you are prepared and in a position to be in that role. So that, that was really, really I think kind of comforting and, and rewarding uh, to be able to do. But you know, my, my colleague, Dr. Robinette is in the critical care field. So I'd, I'd love for her to chime in if she would. Yeah, so I'm really in the thick of it, which um, you know, as devastating as it is. And um, I, you know, we've lost a family friend. I think that the impact on people's individual lives and economy and the global economy and everything else. And certainly, you know, everyone who was at risk before um, is even more impacted by this. So overall, obviously, the pandemic is uh, horrifying and certainly, certainly nothing that anyone would, <laughs> would wish on the world. But from a provider point of view, there is something that is fascinating to know that you're kind of in a historical moment and as someone you know we're the ones doing the trials um you know i take care of patients on ventilators and all those things you hear about and so it, it really is fascinating to be at this point where every week our division has at least one update where it's like well we were doing this but not anymore so now we're doing this and and just you know knowing that we're in the thick of this um historic pandemic and and you know, so curious to see what it will look like when we look back in five years. Um, you know, I think what's hardest, like when you, you hear about a lot of the dis kind of moral distress that uh, healthcare providers, physicians, RTs, MAs, nurses um, are suffering from, is it is hard to watch patients who are alone. Like the lack of visitors in the hospital is weird. Um, and not being able to have those conversations when things aren't going well, um, except for over Zoom, which I had to do on Sunday. And it's just not normal, right? So it's never easy to give bad news, but over Zoom is specifically hard. Um, so I think that, you know, all of this will, um, you know, it, it'll just be interesting to see where things go, but it is, it's awful, but it is, there's kind of this, um, again, I don't use the, excite, the word excitement, but kind of this interest in being in the middle of a very historically meaningful full moment and seeing how things go. It was weird the first time I showed up after being out for three weeks. Um, and everyone was wearing masks at the hospital. You're like, oh, this is really weird. And then all of a sudden you're just like chatting and normal and everyone's wearing masks, but chatting and normal. And it's, it's you know, 
amazing how quickly we adapt to new work environments. But um, yeah, it actually, it's a fascinating time. The, the, thank you so much for sharing that, um, Dr. Robinette. And, and she reminded me to say two things that I wanted to make sure are said, which part of the adaptation uh, with everything that's going on is um, basically all of us in some way have moved towards telemedicine. So even with my outpatient um, clinic, I'm seeing uh, my patients like I'm, you know, like we're doing this now over Zoom essentially and, and giving recommendations that way. And, um, and I know that actually, for example, my best friend from medical school who's an emergency medicine doc out in Portland, Oregon, I just talked to her yesterday to see how she's doing. Um, she's actually doing, using telemedicine with her scribe. So she has a scribe that's still working with her and they just do a Zoom call. She walks into the room, the scribe gets to uh, listen to the, the interaction and document and then they talk a little bit afterwards. So I kind of wanted to bring that up because even as we know that clinical experiences have been interrupted and, and there's a lot of uncertainty, I think that as we all sort of evolve and move towards a new normal, there are going to be opportunities for you to still be involved clinically, even if that might potentially mean use of telemedicine. Um, and then the other point she made that I wanted to touch on too was talking about the financial impact of COVID. And I know Wendy kind of addressed that earlier. She hoped we would just mention or at least touch on acknowledging that there is a financial impact. And certainly the AAMC has been really good, I think, about being aware of that and trying to be uh, flexible and mindful. So in addition to the, you know, rescheduling fees, you know, no, basically being waived, um, they're broadening the spectrum of candidates that they will consider for the fee assistance program. So um, in, in fact, anybody who already had applied and was denied, they're inviting to apply again. Um, so they will reconsider people who uh, were previously um, not awarded financial assistance. They will look at that again because they understand that things have changed. Um, so not only is it something that they will reconsider, even if you, know, even if you weren't maybe directly impacted um, in a major way, I think because they're broadening the, the spectrum of people who will be included, that the likelihood of receiving some financial assistance is greater now. And then the one other thing I would say, which is kind of not at all related, but there are three or four questions about in the chat or about whether or not the pass fail step, pass fail step one came up. And there are several questions about whether or not our curriculum would be influenced by the fact that step one would pass fail. Um, and the short answer is no. We have always emphasized creating uh, humanistic, holistic physicians with uh, an excellent knowledge base and have an amazing group in our Office of Medical Education to help students prepare to study for step one during that time you take off. But our curriculum has generally not specifically been step one focused. So the fact that step one went past fail won't influence kind of what we're teaching during our new curriculum, I think is a fair statement. I agree. Um, I mean, it's kind of a, it's funny the timing because we were already changing our curriculum anyway. We were already kind of updating and adjusting and modifying things. So um, those changes we felt were, you know, we're going to make it an even better experience uh, for our students. And we already recognize that whether the step one was past fail or not. Um, so I don't think it really changes, as Dr. Robin had said, the content of what you're learning because we want you to learn medicine. <laughs> we want you to learn the things that you need to know so you can think like a physician and diagnose patients and develop good treatment plans. Um, but we also understand that that's an important test. Um, and so one thing that um, some things that have been done um, anyway, uh, which were again already planned uh, were to sort of amplify your access to some test prep materials. Um, and we know that as an institution, we would be able to maybe get it at a discounted price. So rather than being an individual signing up for a particular test prep um, program, we can provide one for students um, at, a, at a discounted rate. Uh, and so I think that that's pretty neat. I know that a lot of the course directors are looking at how they can even integrate some of the tools from those test prep programs into their teaching. 
Um, and um, some, I don't, not all of the exams will be like NVME style exams, but I know that um, there will be, there already are, a, a, there's at least a couple and there probably will be more, a few other NVME style exams. Um, and we're, we're constantly revising and reviewing our exam format. So we wanna make sure that they're good tests, that the quality of the questions that you get are good. Um, and also um, that they have a similar format that will help you be prepared for that exam. So, you know, I think I, ultimately, I suppose the, the hope uh, when, when the powers that be decided to make that step one, their hope was to reduce some of the stress and anxiety that people have towards the end of their second year in preparing for that exam. Um, I think it also was inappropriately being used as, as part of the selection process and ultimately would determine what specialty people were going into. Um, which is silly, right? Like, could you imagine if your MCAT exam at the end of the road determined like what your, what specialty you could choose from? I just don't think that that's right. So in any case, <laughs> um, I, I agree with everything Dr. Robin had said. It's not changing the curriculum, but we are looking at ways that we can continue to support our students to make sure that they're successful um, in that exam. And we've always had very excellent, uh, very high pass rates. Um, I think we have time because I want to be mindful of the time. I think we have time for maybe one more sort of general question and then I want to give our students an opportunity for some closing um, remarks. So uh, what's maybe Roshana, is there like one other question or thing you think that we need to, or Wendy, if you think there's something that burning that we should talk about? Um. No, I mean, a lot of people were asking questions about the different elective tracks, um, but I don't know, Dr. Robinette, do you have anything? Or? I mean, the only other last couple of questions that came up, and maybe one of them is a good one to end with, they were asking the students what piece of advice they would have to give them going forward. But just before that, there are about two or three asking about how to answer our secondary question about what you're doing this coming year, if you're taking a gap year and it's been canceled. And I would just say at this point, we understand all of our lives have been turned in a totally like crazy way. This is my, my child unplugged our server, which is why I didn't have good connections <laughs> apparently. So we understand things are different. This is not business as usual. So what I, we would recommend is write what you were planning on do, do uh, sorry, what you were planning on doing and then maybe a little bit about how you might be considering future opportunities or something like that. But we know that when you're writing your, filling out your secondaries, you might not know exactly what you are going to be doing in November 2020 because none of us do. Um, so we are completely understanding of that um, and just do your best to let us know what your thoughts were, what you hope to be doing, and maybe why you're considering those. Um, so then I think the question to the students about the, the best piece of advice might be a good way to wrap up. Yeah, I, I yeah, I completely agree. I have nothing to add, and I think that is a great a great way to end. So, if you want to share a piece of piece of advice, and also maybe why you chose Maryland, let's close with that. Whoever wants to go first. Um, I guess I kind of typed this in the chat, so um, I'm, I apologize if it's kind of redundant. But um, I guess for me, one piece of advice to applicants is like you know during your clinical experiences and opportunities, I would recommend doing your best to try to talk to as many patients as possible. Try to understand their backgrounds, their stories, their different walks of life, because as a physician, you do, you know we do meet and interact with so many people who come from diverse backgrounds. So it kind of helps me better understand what is important to them and how to best approach them during a medical visit and what they value so that way we can um, in the future as providers provide them with the best um, humanistic compassionate and culturally sensitive care as possible um, and so yeah that's my piece of advice um, in terms of why I picked Maryland for me it was really important during the interview day that um, I was able to interact with current students kind of see if I could fit into um, you know the school and kind of uh, the medical students that were currently there. So I felt like Maryland, the students were incredibly welcoming and genuine. Um, I felt like the mentors especially were um, important in my decision because um, like for example, my research mentor is an infectious disease physician. And um, despite my interest in um, pediatrics, he was um, definitely 100% and um, always um, 
kind of gave me all the resources that I needed to succeed in research and encouraged me to pursue my passion. So even if, you know, um, kind of the, the specialty I want to pursue is different from, you know, um, my mentor's specialty, they are 100% there um, willing to work with you and help you achieve your goals and dreams. So um, I think those two aspects, the students and the mentors are what drew me to Maryland. Thanks, Helen. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice is to be kind to yourself throughout this whole application process and throughout your entire journey in medicine. Um, Cause medical school is hard <laughs> um, as I think all of us sort of anticipate, but um, yeah, I think the important thing is like to be kind to yourself and that's how you sort of, that's how you develop the resilience to get through all of the things that you need to get through and to get one step at a time. Um, and I think just like apply the same compassion and empathy that you would give to your patients to yourself and um, just uh, don't get caught up in uh, like comparison with all the other people around you. Um, focus on like bettering yourself and becoming a better doctor and that's really all that anyone can ask for you throughout medical school and um, yeah. I think for, uh, and I always tell people when they ask me about um, tips for interviewing, um, just like be confident and be yourself because that's really all they wanna ask, that's all they wanna know and you are the expert on yourself. Um, so you're the one that can present yourself in the best light and in the best possible way um, and people will see that if you're genuine about it. Um, and I chose Maryland because well, when I had already mentioned, I really wanted to be in the medical Spanish track. That was something that was really unique to Maryland. And I thought that learning medicine in Baltimore, which is a city, um, you know, that sort of has a reputation for having a lot of social issues. Um, and I felt like I, that was a community that I could learn from and give back to at the same time. And I thought that you see a, you see a lot of the social issues in Baltimore play out in our hospital in terms of um, sort of the disease processes and um, you know working with like and the social dis determinants of health in our hospital so I thought that it would be a really great place to challenge myself and to learn um, from a really difficult patient population. You know. Yeah um, so I mean kind of just echoing off um, those points I mean I guess my piece of advice would be just to make sure that, you know, you find your passions um, and, and really explore like what you like to do um, and, you know, really develop interests and hobbies, um, especially before coming into medical school, because oftentimes like those are the things that you're going to rely on to like, you know, try to kind of get through this journey um, and have something to fall back on. Um, and so I think that's just really important to make sure just you, you take time for yourself, um, even before you get into medical school to really explore what's out there um, and really get good experiences. Um, and then also along the lines of the application process, I know Dr. Kizada uh, mentioned this earlier, but um, you, sh you guys should really use the uh, pre-med advising office. Like I can't stress that enough. Um, they were so instrumental. Um, towards just me like getting here right now where I am um, and they really have excellent pre-med advising um, and so I would really encourage you guys to just meet with them talk about you know your journey talk about how you're feeling um, any sorts of support um, because they they really do do a good job um, and then in terms of why I chose Maryland uh, I was really impressed um, when I came here on my interview um, I you know I, I was more, I was more so impressed with like how many resources that Maryland uh, has to offer, but also like just the genuine um, nature of a lot of the faculty that was, that was here. I feel like I didn't really find um, that as much along uh, some of the other places that I interviewed at. Um, and also I wanted to be closer to home. I'm from Maryland itself. Uh, so um, that was definitely a priority for me as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was just really impressed by the faculty, by the students, even like some of the people that were interviewing with me, um, just like my ability to engage with them um, and 
you know, talk to them about anything. Uh, I, I was, I think I was just really happy and blown away by the interview day. So that's kind of why I leaned in here. Thanks, Neil. Cameron, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so my one piece of advice for applicants um, would be to explore your passions um, as opposed to just trying to go through a checklist that you think uh, medical schools want to see. Um, I think if you explore those passions and things that are going to develop you um, to become a future medical student, future physician, um, that's really going to shine through in the application and um, they'll see you as a unique individual who has unique passions. Um, and, and that's what we want to do to build a, a, a great and diverse um, medical school class. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and then for me, um, the thing that really um, made me decide on choosing Maryland is um, I reflected and thought about um, what type of uh, a physician I wanted to be graduating from medical school and, and going on into residency. Um, and that's someone who is uh, very strong clinically um, and well prepared and, and has a good foundation to serve a diverse um, patient population. Um, I had the opportunity actually to, to work with the, the medical system um, during my gap year and I saw that um, we have a very diverse patient population that we serve. Um, there are high powered executives from the Baltimore community that came to get care because um, we offer uh, outstanding patient care um, as well as um, people who have certain disadvantages um, and not as great access to the healthcare system. Um, so coming to a school like Maryland, you really get the opportunity um, to interact with a diverse patient population um, and, and get very strong uh, clinical education from our outstanding faculty members. Um, and that's going to set a really great foundation for you um, moving forward. And that's what I saw. Um, that's why I was happy to decide to come to Maryland. All right. Well, thank you so much. I think that that's a, a great note to end our, our session on. I want to be mindful of everyone's time and from my experience I had when I did a call with some of my mentees, everybody started dropping off the call a little after six to have dinner with their families. So, <laughs> so I, I know it's pretty much dinner time. And, you know, I think that I, I definitely have to acknowledge again and thank our students uh, for um, being with us today, answering these questions, sharing your experiences, chiming in on the chat box. Also, um, our representatives from the Office of Admissions, as well as from your office of, um, you know, from a career advising office, who also um, were, I know, so helpful in managing um, all of the um, dynamic conversation that was going on in the chat. And if there are questions that you didn't get answered today, of course, this is by no means your last opportunity. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we have the email address here. Also remember to kind of check our website intermittently for updates. Um, but Wendy and I communicate pretty regularly. So you all have that uh, additional bonus that you'll be probably among the first to know about any changes that we're making uh, thanks to that. So, um, but yes, please remember that you're always welcome to send any of us questions and, and we're happy to help out. So with that, thanks again to all of you for, for spending this time with us, for, for being here and for your interest. And um, again, just wanna send out that reassurance that um, where we feel the, that, um, you know, that same sense that you have that even though things are difficult, they're challenging, they're different, um, we're all here to learn. We're hopefully all here also to help each other out. And, um, you know, I think together we're all going to find reasonable solutions to sometimes unreasonable situations. I think that that's possible. Um, and what we can always control is how we react to what's happening around us. Um, so as much uncertainty and, and disorganizedness, it seems like there is, um, I hope that you all are able to uh, find quiet time, uh, find opportunities to kind of uh, just sort of center and well. So thank you all and uh, good luck. Take care. Thank you.
It won't let me leave. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> it's nice to see you all. Yeah, you too. Hope everything's going well. Thank you. Thank you. 